Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm here to talk to you about how to be your own CEO at all times in corporate America. But here I'm going to say something really quickly, first thing out. I'm a storyteller, all right? I'm going to talk to you about things I've done in my life that I think will relate to you, that you can use in your own life. But at the same time, I'm big on painting a picture for you to be able to see it yourself and how you can implement strategies into your own life to achieve success. If I'm not giving you strategies or actionable steps to help you in your life, then I'm not doing my job as a speaker, all right? So first thing, your biggest breakthrough moment as a leader is usually found one step outside your comfort zone. Think about that. Every time you do something in life, if you're in a comfortable situation or it feels safe, do you feel like you're really pushing yourself to achieve greatness? For me, playing football, I was an average player in high school, got to college, became a better player. But in order to become an NFL player, I had to get into the breakthrough zone. With my construction company, I started out very small doing concrete making good money, but I wasn't making the lifestyle for myself that I wanted to make. So I stepped into doing earthwork or dirt removal. That was the breakthrough zone. For me, that's when I went from making hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars in two years. But the problem I had was I went from the breakthrough zone to the arrogant zone. Now, when you're in the arrogant zone, you put yourself in danger. Because if you feel that you cannot learn something or you feel that everyone around you is always wrong and you're always right, you become arrogant. And I'm going to tell you a little bit later how that arrogance cost me millions of dollars, cost me my home, my cars, and made me almost homeless just six years ago. So think about that. Six years ago, I was almost homeless and on the street because I was in the arrogant zone, not being in the breakthrough zone because I had success. And instead of staying humble, I got arrogant and I got complacent. To create a consistent high performance culture, you have to drive accountability every single day. If you all in this room want to be successful as a CEO, working an entrepreneur, working in corporate America, whatever you want to do, if you drive accountability every single day, you have the best chance of achieving your goal. People who do not take accountability for the actions in their life are not respected by society. Society respects people. If you make a mistake, you own it, you fix it, you move on. That's the way it happens in society. So every time you think about being a CEO, working for somebody else, being in a business, just think about this statement. To create a consistent, high-performance culture, you have to drive accountability every single day. Effective leadership creates and sustains solid organizational structure. Look at this event, how they put it together. Very well run, very organized, very well structured. They worked hard to have great leadership skills to put this on to help people who wanted to learn how to become better CEOs, better leaders, better entrepreneurs. This is why I am here. I do a lot of speaking for companies like PNC Bank, the Home Depot, the National Football League, and I tell everyone the same thing. If you are prepared and you are organized to do great things in life, you can achieve greatness. So now I'm going to tell you my story, my custom suit to how I got here today. And it's going to start with this man right here, Jack Del Rio. When I was a rookie in the NFL, Jack Del Rio was a rookie head coach. Now do not let the smile, the golden boy hair, the cool Reebok shoes fool you in any magnitude. Jack Del Rio was a hard ass that drove accountability. Jack Del Rio told us, if we are gonna be successful in life, you have to be your own CEO. Does that make sense to you all? If you wanna be the best in life, you have to be your own CEO. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that you can either increase or decrease your value daily. The actions you do in your life determine if you're going to achieve success or not. No one else. People say, well, he was lucky. Well, no, he worked hard. Oh, they had the great opportunity. But what did they do to get into that opportunity? 
You are here in this room right now to get better, to get yourself in a position where you can achieve greatness in your own life. So this is exactly what Jack talked about. He talked about being accountable and being your own CEO. I played the NFL for over five years. And every time I was on an NFL team, that statement got me to be making the football team and enjoying myself on the football field. Because Jack started that for me when I was a rookie, when I was 22 years old. After the NFL, a five-year career, I ended up starting a construction company. Let me ask you all a question. This kind of thing about in your mind. Do any of you all know what you want to do when you leave college? Think about it. Do you have any idea? You want to start a business? Do you want to work for somebody else? Try to figure out exactly what you want to do and start working towards that goal. So this was my reality. When I left the NFL, I struggled with transition immensely. I didn't know what I wanted to do after I left the NFL. So what happened was I decided to take some courses, some entrepreneurship courses. I went to USC, took some development courses, and I decided to start a construction company called Caden Premier Enterprises. All right, what I did was I did earthwork and site removal. So when people wanted to build buildings, I would dig the dirt out and get the foundation ready to lay and build a building vertical. It was a multi-million dollar business that I started in my late 20s. I was 27 years old. Not that much older than you guys that are currently here now. And I became the largest African-American subcontractor in the city of Baltimore for two years. That was my business partner. That was a job site that we were doing in Baltimore City for Johns Hopkins Hospital. Now, here's the thing. When I started the business, I was in that comfort zone. I started small in concrete. Then I got into my breakthrough zone and I started doing earthwork, dirt removal. But here's the thing. I went from the breakthrough zone, which is right where that is. If I would have stayed in that mentality, being humble, being appreciative, right in that picture, I would have never gone bankrupt. But the problem I faced was once I got to that point, you couldn't tell me anything. I was making so much money. I was young. I thought I knew it all. I thought no one could help me become better. And that is the biggest issue that people have when they become CEOs. They don't know how to take advice. They sometimes don't know how to change with the times. And for me and my success, I just stopped listening to people. When you tried to tell me something that I didn't like, I would not listen to you. I would go, one in, go in one ear and out the other. That's all it ever was. I could not be coachable. And that led to the next slide image. I went bankrupt. In 2013, which was literally two years before I came to speak at Bryant. Think about that. In 2013, I filed a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Chapter 7 is the worst bankruptcy you can ever file in business. That means everything you own is gone. Everything. My house was gone. My cars were gone. My friends, my family, my money, everything was stripped from me. Gone. The only thing I had left was about $600 in the bank. That's all I had left. After millions of dollars in the NFL, millions of dollars in, in construction, I was down to just $600 in 2013. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I want you all as leaders, as entrepreneurs, as CEOs of your own life to understand that you, are, you should be living your life in the breakthrough zone. But if you ever step into the arrogant zone, if you're having success, you could end up just like I did. No friends, no money, family gone, house gone, everything gone. So this is, that was my reality. I went from being a successful entrepreneur, CEO, to a pretty much broke, janitor and football coach on the side. I coach kids in football making about maybe, maybe about 
$10 an hour. I worked as a janitor making $8.25 an hour in 2013. That is only six years ago. That's all it was, six years. So in six years, I went from that to where I am now. But I'm gonna tell you something, me being my own CEO, me being the person that actually took responsibility and accountability for my actions is how I got to where I am today. So I'm gonna tell you right now, what was that life-changing moment for me? I tell people, I ask people this all the time. What is the life-changing moment that you have had that has helped you get to where you are? This is my moment. So that's a milk carton. That represents my life-changing moment as a janitor when I got someone spoiled milk on my bare skin. And I said, wow, I was a former NFL athlete, I ran a successful construction company, made millions of dollars, and now I am scrubbing baseboards, spraying pledge on tables, vacuuming floors, taking trash out at three o'clock in the morning. And I put myself there because I did not allow myself to be advisable. I did not allow myself to be coached and people just couldn't talk to me. I was just that arrogant and pompous and when you are like that in business and in your personal life, it is gonna to lead to disaster every single time. So once I had that spoiled milk on my bare skin, I said, okay, what am I going to do to get out of the situation? What skills do I possess that I can put into action to help me create a better life for my family? I said, you know what, I like helping people, I'm a good communicator, and I can storytell well. Let's try to be a speaker. So I started trying to speak in 2013, September. For the first two and a half years, I did not get one paid speaking job, not one. So what did I decide to do? As a leader, you need to learn how to make yourself stand out. You need to figure out if you're gonna start a business or work for somebody or apply for a job, what do you possess that makes you different, unique, better than the competition? So I decided to write a book called it Sleepless Nights. It became a bestseller in two days. What did it do? It talked about my life story Everything from the NFL to my alcohol addiction to my losing my father, everything I had gone through, good, bad, or indifferent, was in that book. All I was trying to do was create a platform to help other people succeed where I failed. And that's exactly what happened when I created value for others as a leader. That is when my business started to take off. This is me speaking for Home Depot and they're at their corporate headquarters in Atlanta. So that was in 2017. So literally about three and a half years after declaring a bankruptcy, I'm speaking on stage in front of a thousand people for the largest home improvement business in the world. So here's a question I have to ask you. Are you willing to do what it takes to build a brand? Are you willing to do what it takes to elevate yourself so you can get the job that you want? Every one of you in this room has the opportunity to do whatever the hell you want to do. Every one of you. But the question is, are you willing to sacrifice, gut it out, and push yourself when somebody tells you no? When someone tells you you're not good enough? When someone tells you, get lost? That, those are responses that I heard for years trying to start my business. For 30 straight months, I was told no. 30 straight months. That's why I had to work as a janitor and a football coach to pay the bills to help support my family because speaking at the time was going nowhere. Nowhere. So, what are you willing to do to make your stock better as a potential CEO in a corporation, starting your own business, and running your own life? Only you can answer that. I can't, right? Now, I'm gonna give you guys some strategies that I feel can help you in your life. 
to help you get where you're trying to be. This is called the success cycle. This is my next book coming out, which will be out in the summer. I'm sorry, it'll be out in pre for pre-orders in the summer, and it'll be out January 28th of 2020. Number one is ambition. Ambition is derived from what do you want to do with your life? What goals do you have for yourself? 42% of people that write their goals down are more likely to achieve success. People who say what they want to do but don't write them down do not want to be held accountable to themselves. Think about that. Have you ever written something down and it's helped you to achieve that goal? If you do that, it's going to help you get where you want to be. So ambition is derived from writing your goals down to help you get where you want to be. The next one is drive. Drive is all about what is your why. Why are you doing what you want to do? You need to have a personal why, you need to have a business why. The why is going to push you when you are being told no every single time. So my why when I started my keynote speaking business was to help other professional athletes not go bankrupt. That is why I started speaking because so many of them were filing bankruptcy from real estate projects going bad, investments going bad. They were just not having success. So I wrote my book to help them and I wanted to start speaking to help athletes not go bankrupt. So that was my drive. So you need to figure out what is your drive? What is your why? Because once you develop and figure out what your why is, you will be able to push past the nose, the anxiety, the stress to reach your goal. And the last one is simple, it's hard work. Hard work is all about outworking your competition and focusing on what you can do yourself. You cannot focus on what the competition is doing other than what they're doing in the business because you can't be them. You have to focus on what you can control and what you do well. If you focus on those things, you're going to have success. So if you put the success cycle into action, ambition, drive, and hard work, you greatly increase your chances of having success in your life. Now, this is ambition. Create a successful plan to achieve your vision. Takeaways, set realistic goals. Set a goal that you know you can achieve with hard work. Do not be setting goals that are not realistic because if the goals are not realistic, you will quit on yourself. So my goal as a speaker was to get a paid job within a certain amount of time. I got to that point. Then I started wanting to get more jobs. So I had to start setting goals realistically and not be putting myself out too far and out on a limb. Because if I went out too far, I would literally give up on myself, which is what happens to most people because they do not set realistic goals. Step out of your comfort zone. I said this earlier. If you are going to achieve greatness, it's in the breakthrough zone, not the comfort zone, and don't go into the arrogance zone. Once you get into the arrogant zone, you're going to have a lot of potential problems. And build a roadmap for your success. A roadmap is a plan that's a year or under to get you to your vision, which is going to be about three to five years out. So if you can't achieve your roadmap of yearly plans and goals, you will never reach the five-year mark. So set a roadmap to help you with your ambition. This is somebody that I've met personally that's from the Boston area. Her name is Mel Robbins. Mel Robbins wrote the five second rule. It was the international bestseller. It sold over 10 million copies. It's now being, it's been, it's been transcribed in 36 different languages, 36. If you want her time for a keynote speech today, it's $50,000 for her time. And she's from Boston. And she wrote the book because she was an alcoholic. She was depressed. She couldn't get out of bed for three months. And she said she saw a rocket ship being launched. It went five, four, three, two, one, and it launched the rocket. That's she said for the first time in three months, she got out of bed and got her life together. So she called the book The Five Second Rule. It has changed millions of lives. 
the, but she didn't start it to make money. She started the book, wrote the book just to help other people who are struggling with addictions. But again, that's ambition. Okay, the next one is drive. What is your why? Identify your why. When you know what your why is, you have a greater chance of achieving success. Set a clear focus. Do not be swayed. I heard you talk about this earlier. Things are being thrown at you all the time. Focus on what you want to do and put blinders on and get that task done. If you're trying to get too many things done, nothing gets done. Nothing. So for me, I had to develop a team of people around me that could do other tasks so I don't get frustrated or don't get myself discombobulated because I'm trying to do too much things. People who try to do everything by themselves, something always gets missed. So set a clear focus to what you are trying to do. And then motivation versus inspiration. I was talking to Devontae about this earlier. Motivation comes from the word motive, which means I want you to do something because I want you to do it. That's short term. Inspiration is when I breathe life into you and then you want to make the change for the long haul. So people keep saying, I want to be motivated, I want to be motivated. Well, I don't want to be motivated. I want to be inspired. Because if I'm inspired, I can go a hell of a lot longer. That is why I tell you all the time, I'm inspired to be a keynote speaker because now I enjoy what I do. And if I'm told no, it's okay. I say thank you very much. Good luck. And I keep going. I used to get so pissed off when I was told no on a speaking job. Like, you don't want me? What's wrong with you? Like, because I was motivated by the money for the short term. Once I changed my attitude to be inspired to help other people, I started getting more speaking jobs. And if I lost a job, I didn't get frustrated anymore. As a CEO and a leader, you don't have the luxury to get frustrated. Because if you get frustrated, your entire staff sees it. And if they see it, the culture goes from being excellent to mediocre to below average. And once your culture is below average, ladies and gentlemen, it is so hard, almost impossible to get it to come back up to where you want it to be. So look to inspire people, not motivate them. This man right here had $7 in his pocket in 1995. Last, I read an article last week. He's done $11 billion in global box office sales from his movies. $11 billion. In 1995, had $7 in his pocket. He says his why was to take care of his mother and buy her a house because the places that they lived his entire life were below average. He has worked his ass off to get what he has in life. He is the highest paid actor in Hollywood today. Are his movies good? No. <laughs> no, his movies are not good at all. They're not. I mean, it's being real. It's the same thing like Skyscraper. Come on, really? I mean, like, uh, what was the one with the gorilla? Um, Rampage? Seriously? No, they're not good. But, but everyone goes to watch his movies because you like him. You like that man. Women like him more, but he is liked by everybody. That is why people pay him so much money. If you want to advertise on his Instagram, it's like cost you like $5 million. He has over 50 million followers on Instagram. So, but again, in 1995, he had $7 in his pocket. And now he's the highest paid actor in Hollywood with his not so high quality movies. Hard work, it's plain and simple. Be willing to outwork your competition. Focus on you. Build your power team. You as a CEO in an entrepreneur position, in a corporate executive position in life cannot do everything by yourself. If you do try to do that, you will not execute your game plan for success. 
So you have to build a power team, have multiple streams of income. Warren Buffett says it best. If you want to be wealthy, have seven streams of income. If you want to be wealthy, make money while you sleep. Otherwise, you will never achieve wealth because you will always be working for the dollar instead of having the dollar work for you. Now, this lady was a swimsuit model, had a chance to talk with her, myself, in person, and she has built a $500 million empire in real estate. Kathy Ireland. She was a swimsuit model that took her brand leveraged it. She even talked about she had some really tough struggles in the beginning because she wanted to do everything by herself. She was so used to being a model with that mentality, you go to the photo shoots by yourself, you do the branding by, like, by yourself. She was so used to doing things her way. Once she started to leverage her brand and build relationships, she went from struggling as an entrepreneur to now being one of the most successful real estate investors in our country. And I had a chance to meet her in person. We spoke on the same stage. I opened the conference. She closed as a speaker. So think about that. Six years ago, I'm almost broke. I'm excuse me, not almost. Six years ago, I'm broke and almost homeless to now meeting Mel Robbins, meeting people like Kathy Ireland, and what does that talk to you about? I made a decision, I was gonna get my life back. I hated being broke. I hated being, doing what I was doing. I hated the way my life was turning out. So I made a decision to get my life back. You all can make the decision to start your life the correct way, but it's up to you. Only you can achieve the success for you, nobody else. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about something very important. Understand, as a senior leader, whatever you do, you need to understand this next slide. These are three potential hindrances or obstacles that could sabotage a senior leader in an organization. Number one, the inability to pivot when times call for it. Let's tell you a short story. I had my construction company. We had massive success. It was around 2010, 2011. There was a new fad came out called Facebook. Social media marketing. What did I say? Oh my God, this is a fad. This won't work. Mark Zuckerberger, who's that? This is never gonna happen. People are not gonna wanna do this. I believe in the old school, old fashioned networking. You go meet people, shake their hand. That's how I built my business. So I did not pivot and start marketing on social media. What happened? I ended up losing 60% of my market share, 60. Because all of my clients were starting to market on social media and I did not do it. So that not pivoting cost me a lot of my business. The second one is the self-imposed pressure to feel you always have to have the right answer. As a leader, the best leaders learn how to listen and take advice. With my old company, if it wasn't me or my business partner, I didn't want to hear it didn't want to hear you. I was like, we are the senior leaders. We got this. And that was the worst way to ever do business. I paid people a lot of money to be on my staff. But here's the problem. I paid them, but I didn't listen to them. So I wasted about a million dollars in payroll because I was paying people who were qualified but I did not allow them to speak. Or worse yet, they would speak and I wouldn't listen. So that led to my demise as well because my employees stopped coming to me and they started not telling me things. The last one is not allowing healthy inclusion. Who has ever heard of Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs had this quote, 
My job as the CEO of Apple is to create an inclusive environment where my employees can express themselves without fear of being judged. Steve Jobs. Me, one of my best employees, my estimator, came to me and said, Marcus, we are spending too much money on this job site in Baltimore. If we don't stop the bleeding of cash in six months, we will be bankrupt. I said, Colin, really? We just got a line of credit, new equipment line, you don't know what you're talking about, go home, enjoy the weekend. That was a Friday. He came in the following Monday, he handed me his two week resignation papers. Six months later, I shut my doors. When you are a leader and you don't allow your trusted advisors to talk or give you advice or allow them to express themselves without fear, you are creating an, a culture that is absolutely horrifying. You're creating a culture that no one wants to work for you. All right? So these three potential obstacles or hindrances can sabotage the best of senior leaders. Number one, the inability to pivot when times call for it. Number two, the self-imposed pressure to feel you always have to have the right answer. And number three, not allowing healthy inclusion. So here are the solutions to these possible hindrances. Number one, hire intelligently. Hire people that can change as times change. Two, accept answers from anyone that has the company's best interest at heart. You don't have to know everything. Learn to take advice and answers from other people in your company. And the third, promote healthy inclusion. Allow people to speak and be heard. If you don't agree with them, that's okay too. Learn how to have dialogue, but never ever judge someone or make them feel insecure or not safe to express themselves. Because if you do, that person will stop talking. If they stop talking, that's when bad things happen. I'm going back to Golden Boy here, Coach Del Rio. In order to succeed in life, you have to be your own CEO. This man has made millions of dollars in the NFL as a coach. He's done well in entrepreneurship. He's a personal friend. He drafted me. I still talk to him to this day. Great man. But what he said has stuck with me my whole life. So I'm telling you exactly what an NFL high quality coach that's been around for many years has said, and he's been a great businessman as well. You have to be your own CEO in order to succeed in life. Otherwise, you will never reach your full potential. Anybody have any questions for me uh, on anything? Yes. That's a great question. So here's the thing. When you're a leader, you have to look at the experience factor, okay? Your, tr your trusted advisor, how much experience do they have in that situation? So take me. I owned Caden, right? I owned it. But the problem is Colin was my estimator. Colin was my numbers guy. So when it came to the area of seeing the numbers, even though I'm the CEO, Colin is in the trenches in that area. So who has more experience in that area? Colin does. You know what I mean? So it's really about what area of expertise as a leader you possess. If like for me, if it's like marketing or strategy of marketing, that was my area. I, I would listen to myself and my gut over someone else. Even though I would hear them, I would take my, my initiative a little bit more serious because that's my area. But in that regard, Colin was the numbers guy. So I should have listened to Colin and put my own ego pride to the side. If I would have done that, I would still probably have my business today. But what happens is as a senior leader, a CEO working for yourself or other people, 
sometimes we get blind to our own success. And sometimes we get so pompous, so arrogant, that we just can't hear anything but our own success and our own pickheadedness. So as a leader, you have to learn how to decipher what you're the best at and what your trusted advisors are the best at. And then look at it from that perspective and kind of grow from there. That was a great question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, how did you go about and how long did it take to write the book? Great question. So I signed my contract in October 2014. It got released a year to the day later. So I tell people, I tell people when it comes to a book, if you have a good publisher, you're working with them kind of, you know, on the whole process, it's about a year. Now, if you're going to self-publish, you, it can take anywhere from six to nine months. So if you're writing like your own manuscript, you can go, go to create a space, pay them to kind of be your publisher or your, or, or your, your self-publisher, and it takes you about six to nine months, somewhere in that range. But it all depends upon how good are you at writing a manuscript, because if you go through with a, a self-publisher, they do not do edit checks. Now a publisher, like I'm working right now, so my first book was a year. The second one will take probably about 15 months because I'm working with a publisher who's more established and we're going through like a metadata form, like you know things you put on Amazon. We're going through a photo shoot for the cover of the book. We're going through you know marketing strategy. I mean, so it's a much more comprehensive deep dive because the publisher is more established. So you could be, you, but ballpark's gonna be about a year if you're going with the publisher, it's about a year. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I know many people go through the facing denial and saying no, you know? So mm -hmm. accepting follow is not three times. But you did. My question is if you were said the publisher said no to you, how would you have won about that? Huh. Okay, so let's go back. So my first book got published, all right? I became a best selling author. Who here thinks that I got told yes quickly for the second book? Anybody think I got told, told yes quickly? I got turned down 12 times. I got turned down by 12 different publishers after my first book came out. I gave them over my manuscript, or you, you, can, call like your, um, you can call it like your synopsis. They said, mm, Marcus, doesn't really sound that good. We're going to pass. We're going to pass. Now, you talk about networking, right? This is what this conference is about. You talked about that earlier yourself, right? Networking. So when I spoke for Mel Robbins' platform called Kick Ass with Mel, I interviewed with her in Boston, okay? After the interview was over, I told her I had a great book idea, but no one picked it up. So what did she do? She called her publisher... Post Hill Press, the CEO, and said, Anthony, Marcus is a personal friend working on a book project. I don't want you to pick it up for me. I don't want you to do anything for me or promise him anything. Will you talk with him about his book project? We ha I had a call a week later with Anthony. After the discussion, he said, Marcus, any friend of Mel's a friend of mine. Your book sounds interesting. If we can tweak this, tweak this, tweak this, I'll pick it up. I said, yes. So relationships and networking got me to a publisher that has now helped now publish my upcoming second book. But to answer your question more specifically, I was told no 12 times by 12 different publishers. Who here has ever heard of Dr. Seuss? Dr. Seuss was told no by 28 different publishers. 28 people said, Dr. Seuss, your book sucks. 28. The 29th one said, you know what, man? Maybe this might work. We'll try it. They have sold multi, multi millions of copies of his books. Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions. But 28 publishers told Dr. Seuss, no. Right? Abraham Lincoln lost eight primary elections running for president. Eight. You know what I mean? So it's all about how much do you want it. I was told no for 30 straight months for a paid speaking job. 30. That's two and a half years. 
People say, Marcus, you're having all this overnight success. Bull. Okay? 30 straight months of being told no. People say, Marcus, are you crazy? Why would you keep going? Because if I had quit, where would I be? If I had have gave up on my vision, what kind of example is that for my daughters? I have a 15-year-old, a 4-year-old. So I could tell them it's okay to quit when times get hard. I can't do that. That's not, that's not who I am. So the question to you that I'm going to pose back to you is, how bad do you want something that being told no will not take you off that track? Ma'am, I'll come back to you. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I just said, I call women ma'am. So, um, going back to the 30 months um, comment you just made. Yes. Right. Must have done Great. During that period of time in order to get you to that first step. So to be, to be totally honest, I didn't tweak anything as far as my approach. Mm -hmm. What happened was I found a platform called Speaker Match that I put my information on. The company then found me. It was, it was Miller Mock College in Wilmington, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They found me. We had a discussion and then they paid. They had no idea I had not been paid a job. None. Because my website looked semi-okay, but my problem was every time I got on the phone with people, I would always say, hey, I'm Marcus Ogg, I'm a former NFL athlete, this is what I can do for you. And every time I would talk myself out of a job because I didn't learn how to listen. The best leaders listen first, talk second. When you listen, you're creating value for the person who's talking. When you're trying to sell a product, People who are your potential clients want to speak. They want to be heard. If they're going to put their money in your hands, you better listen to what they have to say first. Then tell them how you can create value for them. But once I learned that, that how to listen first and talk second, then my job started to get more and more increasing for paid. Yes, sir. I'll come to you after that. Mm -hmm. But say you're stuck in the arrogance zone, mm -hmm. how do you get out of it? When you're stuck in the arrogance zone, what you have to do, the number one thing you have to do is be coachable. You have to get someone that you respect, either an elder, a mentor, who can pull you back down. The problem I had was with Caden, my old company, my business partner, who was 41 years my elder, he was kind of egging me on to be arrogant. So my mentor system was not a good one. So you have to be sure to find a trusted advisor that has expertise in your lane. And if you feel you're, and a good mentor will see that and pull you down. Like me now, I have a speaker manager. When she met me about a year ago, my website was not good. My materials were not good. She had to say, hey Marcus, look, you're at this price point. But your, but your materials are down here. We either have to raise you up with better material or pull your price down to match what you are. What do you want to do? I was so pissed off at her. I'm like, how dare you talk to me like that? Like, you didn't know me. But then once I stopped being arrogant and I listened to her and myself, I said, damn, she's right. Damn, like my videos don't match my price point. I, my website is, you know, C League needs to be A League. So now as I've gotten older and wiser, I trust people more that have proven their worth and I take advice. That's why I'm having so much success today because I'm blessed to have a great power team around me that guides me in the right direction. Make sense? What's up, sir? All right, two thoughts. Let's go first question. So why did I choose construction? That's a great question I wish I could answer. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to answer it right now. The reason I chose it was because I went to a, a meeting kind of like this, like a networking event. One of the congressmen there, Congressman Elijah Cummings, said Baltimore is missing a minority contractor to come in 
and take the market share. I said, oh really? Great, here I am. So I had no experience in construction. I went to one course at USC, that's it. But I found a business partner who I thought had the experience. So we merged. And unfortunately for me and being so young, I faced no adversity in that business in the first three years. We came on the scene, we were doing concrete, but then when we went to earthwork, boom, we became Baltimore's hot item. But then, because I was growing so quickly, my cash flow could not keep up with my payroll. And I went bankrupt. So going back to your other question, would I get involved in it again today with the right partners? Yes. If they had the cash flow behind it, it was the right market, yes, I would. But honestly, that's a lot of work. And speaking to get where I am today took a lot of work. So again, it's about having that focus. Do I wanna pull myself away from speaking to do something like this? Maybe not right now, but maybe in two years, when it's more established and it's turning on its own, I might try to get back in and be a minority partner in that business. Because it's great money, but it's just a lot of work. You have a question, Devante? You have a question? Yeah, well, you answered it. No, what was it? Uh, what was the question before? Um, what type of work did it take to get to the NFL? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, to get to the National Football League, it took being my own CEO every single day my last two years of college. Because before then, that wasn't my goal. I wanted to work on Wall Street. I wasn't wanted to be an investment banker. I have a degree in finance. That was my because my father was also in finance as well. So that was my vision. When the NFL came to me and said, hey, Marshall, you could be drafted, I then shifted my vision to go down that lane all the way. But it was like getting up early, 5 a.m., workouts, extra work, film study. I mean, watching my diet, getting a strength coach. Like, it was pouring everything I had into that brand for, two, for 24 months, and it paid off. But I tell people all the time, if you're trying to be an athlete, don't focus on getting to the NFL. Focus on doing your job, doing what you do. That last year or two, you'll know if you're NFL bound. But if you focus on it for like your whole life, like high school, college, early, I'm in college, you know, all this type of stuff, you're gonna burn out. You're gonna burn out. I know so many players that I've played with that got to the NFL and never made it because they were just, by the time they got there, they were so burnt out. They've been, they've been chasing the NFL dream since Pop Warner. I never did that. Make sense? So focus on what you can do, and then if you're getting to that point, you're going to know. You're going to know if you're in that lane. The NFL will find you if you're that good. But don't put all your energy into it because then you can miss out on other opportunities to achieve success. You don't want to do that. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. I'll come over to you after next. Yep. How, like, obviously, I think that playing a team sport like football teaches you a, a lot of life lessons. So how much of your success and ability to bounce back from failure, how much of that was your attribute to playing football as a team sport your whole life? Read that. Oh, except for that. F. Don't read, the F. read that now. <laughs> that was ingrained in me by Jack Del Rio. Earn your spot every single day. Not every other day, not once in a while, every single day. This is the attitude I took into keynote speaking. This is the attitude I take in my everyday life now. So football has taught me so much about resiliency, perseverance, and dedication. The same thing I'm telling you about working that lane to try to get to the NFL when you know it's in your reach. That is how I live my life every single day. And football has been a huge part of that. That is why it's always my final thought. What was your question? You said you were a finance major and you were looking to Wall Street. Yep. Trade. Say again? Are you an investor? Did you trade? Oh, I used to, yes. When I was in the NFL, my first few years, I did investments, I did trades, all that kind of stuff. When I actually got out, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. My second part of the question hmm? was, there's a lot of arrogance and greed in that as well. How do you deal with that because you were experiencing some of that before. Great question. You know how? My father. My father was an economics major at Howard and got his master's from the University of Maryland. 
So my dad had, the, he used to run the stocks and bonds room for the Federal Home Loans Bank of, of New York in their DC office. He was one of their first African-American bank managers to run their stock room. So he was that doing that in 1979, I believe that was the year. So I learned from him about how to be very humble and very just patient and not to be arrogant. And actually, the reason I got like that with my construction company, if my father had been alive with the success I was having with Caden, I'd been a whole nother person. Cause he'd have beat the crap out of me and say, what is wrong with you, Marcus? Like he would have never let me get into the arrogant zone. He'd have pulled me out of it long before I got there. So when I lost my father, I lost that person who was my mentor that I needed, didn't have it. And my business partner kind of knew that and he would egg me on and push me to be more arrogant as we became successful because he was living his youth through me. I was 27, he was 68. So as we had him making all this money, all this type of stuff was going on, he was loving my arrogance because then what happened is he could control me because I trusted him. So losing my father, I lost that mentor to keep me where I needed to be. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Right. That's a great question. So you can do two things. One, you can spend a couple hundred dollars and get a background check on someone, which I should have done. But because I was so eager to get into business with somebody and I had lost my dad, I didn't do that. The second thing is there's three ways to build trust. Competency, reliability, and having each other's back. My partner was competent, but not in the area that I needed him to be. I should have asked him more questions to verify his knowledge. Second thing is reliability. Getting the job done in the time frame that is set. Caden was always off schedule, always. But because we were a minority contractor, GCs put up with us. I should have known something was up, but they kept paying us and paying us, but I found out they liked me, hated my old partner, but because we were a minority, we were protected by the laws and they had to pay us and keep us moving. And the third one is having each other's back. My partner would talk to me so disrespectful, but he always said, I'm just joking with you. I'm just joking with you. Looking back on it, he was degrading me, trying to say it was a joke to keep me under his, his control. And it worked and it worked until my wife came in and helped me see that the way he was talking to me was not acceptable. Then I started to break away from him and he didn't like my wife and then eventually the company dissolved and then everything went away. So it was a very difficult process for five years to be controlled by somebody that you think is supposed to be your friend and your partner. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Can you re-say it three one more time? Yeah, it's competency, reliability, having each other's back. Those are the three things that build trust. And the last thing I'll say is when it comes to uh, communication, number one is a three-step process that I use to communicate effectively. Number one is identify what needs to be communicated. Number two, deliver your message clearly and concisely, okay? And the third thing is make sure at all costs after you deliver your message that you're gonna listen authentically and genuinely. So again, it's identify what needs to be communicated, deliver your message clearly and concisely, listen authentically. If you can do those three things, it helps you to create a communication process that creates value for you and for your brand. And people are also going to want to respect you more because they know that they can communicate with you. If they can communicate with you, they can work with you. That's huge in business. All right, I want to be round of applause for
So, dude, when you played with Ray Lewis, did you take it kind of under skin? Like, what was like the biggest thing that you remember him telling you? He always you? talked about the true champions are going to succeed no matter what talent they're dealt. Because Ray Lewis wasn't the biggest guy in the world. He was like 225, 230 pounds. Mm -hmm. But he had the heart of a lion. And that heart led him to have a 17-year career in the NFL and a first battle Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. So he talks about doing the most with what you can do with the talent that you, with the talent that you have. That's key. So once I, once I understood that, I started saying, man, okay, I don't have as much, much talent as my brother, but I can do things, other things differently. Yeah. And I started to do that. And that led to my success in football and then in my career now as in construction that I had and then now in my speaking business today. Awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you very much. No problem, Appreciate man. It. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, no problem. Well, my name is Melvin. I'm currently running a club, and we're trying to go through it, and we're going through a rebranding re stage. Sure, sure. And I'm trying to build a community, trying to give students that community where they, where they can kind of ask each other for advice. Sure, like, 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 a, like, a, like a mastermind kind of group. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm having trouble trying to get kids past the stigma that all just because I'm not a business major, I can start a business, or I might not have time mm -hmm. to, to start one. How do I kind of... So talk about how the mastermind will create value for them and help them with their individual needs. People, especially the youth, want to know how can this help me? So tell them that the value that this program will bring to them will help them get where they want to go in life. You get a much better, you'll get a much better response. Thank you, Absolutely, man. Good if luck. one idea that you hope the students walk away with today from your session, what do you hope that is? I hope they develop the mentality to push through the difficult times. Because being a CEO, an entrepreneur, just life in general, is very challenging. And if you have the mentality to push through, you can succeed. But the ones who shut down or kind of fold when times get tough, that's what the ones who don't who don't succeed in life. So I'm hoping that they get the mentality to always push through no matter what adversity that they face.